Okay, let's uh, open our Bibles. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. And as you can see on the screen behind me, today is part 6 of what will be a 7-part series. Here in the entire chapter of chapter 2, the series entitled Sound Doctrine in the Church, Sound Behavior in the Church. And today we're going to be studying a new section within that section. Uh, verses 11 through 14. So let's read God's holy word together. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. This is God's holy authoritative, inspired word of truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. Okay. Well, again, you understand the context we're in here. We're in chapter 2. And we know that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was writing this letter, this letter of instruction, to a young pastor by the name of Titus, who was responsible to get the numerous churches, house churches, there on the island of Crete, he was responsible to get them in order. And that's why in chapter 1 of this letter, Paul tells Titus that it's vitally important for Titus to raise up godly elders. A plurality of male godly elders in those churches. That's chapter one, church leadership. Chapter two, the section we're in today, and the section we've been in for a while, uh, chapter two is all about Paul instructing Titus to instruct the churches how they were to behave, how Christians are to behave in Christ's church. That's the section we're in right now. Christians and their behavior in the church. And then starting next week, we'll go to the last chapter of this letter, chapter 3, and we're going to see how Paul instructed Titus to instruct the Christians how they were to live, not simply in the church, but also in the world amongst non-believers so again chapter one leadership in the church godly elders chapter two behavior in the church it must be sound godly behavior chapter three behavior in the world again it must be sound it must be holy it must be godly and god honoring now again in chapter two uh, we see that Paul had been giving instructions to Titus so that he could instruct various different groups within the church as to how they were to behave. And again, let's just make our way through this again in verse 1. Uh, Paul said to Titus as an elder, But as for you, speak, proclaim, declare constantly, the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Sound doctrine must, must, must be taught by the elders in the church. That is one of the behaviors of elders. They are to teach from the pulpit, in groups, one-on-one, -on -one, as they counsel, as they confront, as they correct, as they comfort, elders are responsible for the dissemination 
of sound doctrine in the church. Because as we've been learning, sound doctrine in the church will lead to sound behavior in the church, right? Unsound doctrine, unsound behavior. That simple. A person will behave based upon that person's beliefs. If that person believes or has a high view of God and a low view of himself, realizing that we are unworthy sinners, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and that we owe our allegiance to God, who is holy, who is awesome, and is to be feared and revered, if that type of belief is in a person, the person will behave accordingly. But if a person has a low view of God and a high view of themselves, well, why do I have to submit to God? Or I don't have to submit to everything God says, do I? And as a result, you're going to have unsound behavior. Because that person believes that God is not really holy, or maybe God doesn't see everything or really care about everything. Or that, you know what, God will let you get away with certain things. Unfortunately, what I just defined is what would be considered Christianity today, or a vast majority of Christianity today. God loves you. God wants what's best for you. He wants you to have your best life now. And you're saved by grace. Just say the prayer. Just say the prayer. Now you're in. How am I supposed to behave? Well, try to do your best. Well, how, how, how do I do that? Especially if sound doctrine is not being taught. Right? Well, after telling Titus, an elder, how elders are supposed to behave in the church, constantly teaching sound doctrine, Verse 2, we see how older men in the church are to behave. They're to be temperate, dignified, sensible. Remember we learned that Greek word sophron? We're going to see it again today. Self-controlled. Sound in faith, sound in love, sound in perseverance. Older men cannot try to act like younger men. Older men are to be godly examples for younger men and for others in the church. What about older women? Verse, verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior. Not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine. Rather, older women are to teach what is good. Who are they to teach? Verse 4, they are to teach, instruct the young women in the church, right? And how are young women supposed to behave in the church? After they receive the proper instruction from the elders in the church and from older, reverent, godly women in the church. Younger women are to love their husbands, love their children. They're to be sensible, again, sophron, self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the Word of God will not be dishonored or blasphemed. So we see here in chapter 2 how different groups of people within the church are supposed to behave in the church. Elders, teach sound doctrine constantly. Older men, be reverent, be dignified, be good examples to the church. Older women, same thing. And teach the younger women how they're to behave. How are younger women to behave? Love their husbands, love their children, be workers at home. Be sensible, be pure. So that the word of God and the name of God is not blasphemed. Verses 6 through 8. How are younger men in the church supposed to behave? Likewise, Paul told Titus, urge the young men to be sensible, self-controlled, sophron, not given to excess. And that's why he said in verse 7 to Titus, you set an example for these young men so that they can be sensible in all things. Titus, 
as an elder, and again, all elders should do this, they should set examples for the younger men. Their example of good deeds, purity of doctrine, dignified life, sound in speech, their daily conversation, which is beyond reproach so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. We see how elders are to behave in the church. We see how older men, older women, younger women, and younger men are to behave in the church. Notice the word sensible. We see that continuously repeated. Verses 9 and 10, our study last time. How are even bond slaves to act? You know, again, as I taught you last time, there in the Roman Empire, uh, bond slaves basically fueled the economy. They were the workers in the economy. Now, unfortunately, many of them were abused, but many weren't. They had, a, as bond slaves, they had a, a food to eat. They had, they had shelter over their head. They had an opportunity to do something with their lives because otherwise, if they weren't bond slaves, if they had gone on their own, who knows, they would have ended, might have ended up on the street, homeless and helpless. So Paul told Titus about bond slaves in the church who had come to faith in Christ. How were they to behave? They were to be subject to their own masters and everything. To be well-pleasing, first to God, and then their earthly masters. Not argumentative, not pilfering, stealing, trying to get over on their masters. But they need to show all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Do do, do you see why sound behavior is so key? Because what we do represents our God who saved us. And so, we see again, as sound doctrine is flowing in and through the church, we see what is being taught from God's Word should impact the behavior of God's people. Again, older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and even bond slaves. In our current culture context, we would call them employees. Right? Well, today, we're going to see in verses 11 through 14, that it's not only the responsibility of elders in the church to instruct people in the church as to how they are to behave. Watch this. You're going to see today that saving grace actually also instructs God's people in the church. And I know you may be confused in what I'm saying there, but I think this will become pretty clear. Let's look at our text for today, verses 11 through 14. Let's underline some words. For, there's your connector from what he just said prior to, right? Again, in our section here, it's about sound doctrine, sound behavior, right? Paul goes on to say to Titus, for the grace of God has what? Appeared. Underline the word appeared. Bringing what to all men? Salvation. Underline salvation. Verse 12. Not only has God's grace appeared, not only has God's grace saved, look at verse 12. God's grace also what? Instructs instructs God's people to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, there's your Greek word sophron again, righteously and godly in the present age. Let's stop there and let's get a clear understanding of what Paul is saying to Titus. I love this part because it takes the pressure off of me as a pastor. I know my responsibility for you, right? Again, verse 1. To constantly feed you and teach you, instruct you with sound doctrine. It's my responsibility as an elder, right? But I love the fact that I'm not the only one teaching, <laughs> right? Grace instructs you as well. What do we mean by that? 
Verse 11, we see that the grace of God has what? Appeared. Grace has appeared. Appeared is where we get our word epiphany. Uh, Epiphino is the Greek word. Grace has appeared. Grace has made itself known. Grace has shined. Manifest itself. Now, a lot of Christians, and they are correct in believing this, a lot of Christians believe that grace is an attribute of God. Absolutely, 100% correct. But grace is not simply an attribute of God. Grace is the person of God. Who appeared? 2,000 years ago. Which person of the Trinity? God the Son. Just hop over to John chapter 1. You know this text. Verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, before there was any beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And the Word was God, God the Son. He was in the beginning with God, again, before there was any beginning. In fact, all things, verse 3, came into being through Him. Through whom? Through this Word. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend or overpower or overtake this word. Now, who is this word? Hop over to verse 14. The word what? Became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Who's John talking about here? Jesus Christ. You see how grace has appeared? Again, grace is not simply an attribute of God. Grace is also the person of God. Let's keep reading. We saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Full of what? Grace and truth. Do you see it? John, John the Baptist testified about Him and cried out saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after Me. In other words, he he was born physically after me. Again, John the Baptist was born six months prior to Christ. He who comes after me has higher rank than I, for he has existed before me. What was John the saying? This isn't an ordinary man. This is the perfect God-man who has existed before all time. The second person in the Trinity who became man. Verse 16, For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ no one has ever seen God meaning God the Father at any time but only the only begotten God who's he talking about here God the Son the second person in the Trinity who is in the bosom of the Father he when he appeared has explained him to us. Let's go back now to Titus chapter 2. So after telling Titus about how various different groups of people needed to behave in the church, I love, as now Paul's about to explain to Titus, hey, you've got some help there. Grace is instructing people in the church. And he starts to describe this grace. Verse 11, he says, the grace of God has appeared. You can write this down. He is referring to the incarnation of Christ. God the Son taking on the form of flesh. Grace, the person of grace, has appeared. That's the incarnation of Christ. What else has grace done? Did it just appear? No, second part of verse 11. 
Grace has brought what? Salvation to all men. Here we go. As he's setting up this theme, how saving grace instructs people in the church, he starts out by explaining and reminding Titus about the incarnation of Christ. Grace has appeared. Then he reminds Titus about the salvation of Christ. Grace didn't just appear. Grace has saved. Now, some people will say, well, Andrew, look, grace has saved all men. Well, that would be then called, that, that would be universalism, right? Because not everybody is saved. Universalism, as you know, teaches, it's a false doctrine that teaches that God saves the entire universe. That hell is empty. There is no hell, actually. That everybody, because of God's love, gets to spend eternity with God. And they will use this verse here saying, look, Grace has appeared, that's talking about Jesus. He's appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, uh, just hop over to Titus chapter 1. Paul starts out in his opening. He says, Paul, I'm a bondservant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus for the faith of those, what? Chosen of God. In the Greek, he says, for the faith of the elect. So same writer, Paul, chapter 1, same letter, talks about how God has chosen, not everybody, He has chosen His elect. In fact, just hop over to 2 Timothy. And Paul says the same thing to another young pastor, Timothy. Chapter 2, Paul was in his final second Roman imprisonment. There in Rome, he's about to die. He was about to be beheaded by Nero. And we see Paul saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 2, starting in verse 8, he says to Timothy, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. Verse 10, for this reason, Paul says, all the suffering he was dealing with, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are the elect. Do you see it? Again, same writer, Paul, under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul preached a doctrine of election. God saves those who have been chosen before the foundation of time. They are the elect. He does not save everybody. Okay? Oh, wait a second, Andrew. Uh, you, since you're in 2 Timothy, just hop over to 1 Timothy, Andrew, uh, chapter 4. Uh, look what it says in verse 10. When Paul was telling Timothy, for it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. Stop. Is God the Savior of all men? Everybody look at me. Yes. Wait a second, Andrew. Just a few minutes ago, you just said no. Listen. In a temporal sense, God is the Savior of all men. In a temporal, physical sense. For instance, are there people today that you know that have not trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Yes or no? Yeah. They ignore Christ. They may be blaspheme Christ. They want nothing to do with Christ. What would you call that? One word. Sin. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is what? Eternal damnation. In other words, the moment somebody sins, does God have the right to send them immediately to hell? Yes or no? Absolutely. But He doesn't. Those people that you know who want nothing to do with Christ, who are sinning against Christ, 
still get to enjoy many physical benefits from Christ. They get to breathe the same air that we as believers breathe. They get to eat food that's provided by God, right? There are many benefits here on earth that even non-believers experience from Christ. So in a temporal, physical way, God is the Savior of all men. He has not yet sentenced certain people to damnation in terms of sending them to hell, even though they sin all the time, right? So, when Paul says, we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior in a temporal, physical way of everybody. That's called general grace, right? But he finishes the sentence by saying that God is the Savior of all men, but especially, the Greek word melista, specifically, God is the Savior eternally of believers. Does that make sense? So, God is the Savior of all men in a temporal physical sense. Non-believers today enjoy many of the benefits here on earth that even believers experience. But God is the Savior of the souls specifically, especially, only of believers. Okay? So, Let's go back to Titus and let's tie this together. Verse 11. Paul is talking about grace. Not simply grace as an attribute, but specifically grace as a person. The second person of the Trinity. For the grace of God has appeared. That is the incarnation of Christ. What has He done? Second part of verse 11. He has brought salvation to all men. Well, is He saying that every person is saved? Even those who reject Christ? No. Who is saved? Believers. Those who are the elect. And in this context, when he says all, all can refer to all kinds of people. Not just Jews, but also Gentiles. Not just Jews and Gentiles, but specifically even, look at verses 9 and 10. Even bond slaves. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they, wait a moment, bond slaves? The lowest class of society? Back then? Um, So that these bond slaves will show all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. For the grace of God has appeared. Christ's incarnation. And what did He do? He brought salvation to all men. Not every soul. But to all kinds of people. So we see grace has appeared. That's the incarnation. Grace has saved. That is salvation. And how is it that grace has saved? Verse 14. Actually, end of verse 13. Our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. By the way, do you see that? 
right there, Paul's declaring what? The deity of Christ. He's calling him God. Our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Why is he the Savior? Look what he did for you. Verse 14. He gave himself for whom? For everybody? No. For us. Who's the us? The elect. Do you see it? That's it. He gave himself for us. There's your doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. We're the guilty sinners. Every human is guilty before a holy God. We come into this world with a sin nature we inherited from Adam and Eve. That causes us to be separated from God. We are dead to God. And we are under the just judgment of God. We are all on a highway to hell. And because we are people who are in bondage to our sin nature, and because we are people who are dead to God and doubly blind to God, guess what? We only want to go one way. Where our sin nature leads us. And so what God in His grace does is He saves some. He saves the elect. He saves them from going where they want to go. Any others? He lets them go where they want to go. God doesn't force them that way. But because God is a just judge, He must punish sin. The elect have been chosen. Before the foundation of time. It's called the covenant of redemption between the three persons of the Trinity. A covenant that was made before anything ever was. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made a sovereign choice of saving you, Christian. Not because of anything good you've done or would do. But because of God's grace. Again, just hop over to chapter 3. We see, verse 4, when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Notice, by the way, um, the Trinity in these verses. You see God. You see the Holy Spirit. You see Christ Jesus our Savior. The three persons of the Trinity made a sovereign choice in electing some to eternal salvation. And that choice triggered something. In order to save or have the elect be able to spend eternity with a holy God. The sins of the elect had to be taken care of. That's why grace appeared. And look what grace did when grace appeared. Grace saved us. How? Again, back to chapter 2. Verse 14. He gave himself for us. How about that one? The perfect God, man, Jesus Christ. You know, grace has appeared. Perfectly fulfilled the law for us in our place. The perfect obedience, the perfect righteousness fulfilled of Christ has been credited to our account. Where God looks at us as though we have perfectly obeyed the law. But we didn't, and we can never. But the perfect righteousness, the perfect obedience of Christ has been credited to us. 
But not just that. After perfectly fulfilling the law, he then went to the cross for us law breakers. And what did he do? He gave himself. God has to punish sin. If he punishes us, we go straight to hell. We needed a perfect substitute, a sinless substitute to be given for us in our place to be able to pay for our sins. No human could do the job. And again, that's why grace has appeared. So that grace could save sinful wretches like us. And as Christ was on the cross, again, look what it says. He gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us. To purchase us. From the slave market of sin, self, and Satan. He appeared for us. He saved us. How? By giving himself for us. So that he could redeem us. And it was there on the cross that as Christ hung there, God the Father in his love for us, the elect, took our sins, placed them on Jesus, and punished him in our place as our substitute. He gave himself for us to redeem us. He died the death we deserve, but three days later he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for us. And through Christ, we are granted forgiveness of sins. Why? He per perfectly fulfilled the law for us in our place and He perfectly paid for our lawlessness, our sins, once for all time. And through Christ, through His death and resurrection, He has purchased, redeemed the elect. We once were outside the family of God on a highway to hell. Through Christ purchasing us, redeeming us, giving Himself for us, we have been brought into the family of God through Christ and we're on a highway to heaven. He gave Himself for us, verse 14, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself. A people, notice not everybody, a people, for his own possession. That's what he did for us. So again, back to verse 11, we see the grace of God has appeared. That's his incarnation. The grace of God, second part of verse 11, has saved us. That's his salvation. How did he do it? Verse 14. The grace of God gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us. From every lawless deed. He paid for your sins, Christian, in full. Your past sins, your present sins, your future sins. He redeemed you from every lawless deed. Why? He wants to purify, he wanted to purify you to make you his own. That's substitution. That's redemption. So we see incarnation, we see salvation. How? Substitution, result, redemption. Well, you see how much doctrine is here? This could get dangerous. I could go on for several hours. <laughs> but I won't. So, so Paul is reminding Titus of some really key doctrine. Again, think about it. Think of the doctrine we see so far. Verse 11, part A, we see the incarnation. Verse 11, part B, we see salvation. Verse 12, you're about to see sanctification. Verse 13, you're going to see glorification. Verse 14, you see substitution and redemption. And oh, by the way, at the end of verse 13, you see the deity of Christ, our great 
God and Savior, Christ Jesus. That's why, again, it is very tempting for me to just go deeper and deeper here because there is so much. In fact, one of the men I mentor is Greek, and he, when we study, um, we do it straight from the Greek. He reads the Greek, and, and I know enough words, for, you know, biblical words in the Greek where I can understand it. I'll never forget when we went through this section, his jaw dropped because of the depth of doctrine here. I mean, he was just blown away. Because again, he's reading it in the original language and he's going, this is unbelievable. But of course it is. Because now we get to our main point. Grace has appeared. Grace has saved. What is grace doing now? It instructs God's people. Do you see it? Verse 12. There's your sanctification part right here. Verse 12, grace instructs us. Do you see it? So, uh, guys, here's what you have to instruct you. It's called the mind of Christ. Inspired by the Spirit of Christ. And we as believers who have the Spirit of Christ in us, the Spirit of Christ illuminates this truth about Christ to us. And you're constantly being instructed. Instructed. Again, that's why elders need to constantly bring sound doctrine. I could have just zipped through this section very quickly. Grace has appeared, grace has saved us. But there's so much doctrine here. And I'm counting on grace, the grace that has appeared, the grace that has saved you. I'm counting on that grace right now to instruct you. Right? To instruct you to do what? To say no and then say yes. Grace, verse 12, instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. You show me a person who says that they are a true born-again believer and they are playing around in the world all the time? Hello? I, I thought that, you know, the grace that appeared, the grace that saves, the grace that's now instructed, I thought that grace instructs believers to say no to the world. Not yes to the world. Right? Uh, just hop over to James real quick and we'll come right back. James chapter 4. Look how grace instructs us, Christian. James 4, verse 4. James said, you adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Is that pretty clear? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's pretty clear. In verse 6, God gives greater grace. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who humble themselves to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And those who are true born-again believers who humble themselves to the instruction that grace now provides. If you want to have a grace-filled life, Christian, you've got to be humble. If you want to have a grace-less life, just be proud and go play around in the world and you'll show yourself to be a fraud and a phony and a hypocrite and not a true born-again believer. Back to Titus. I'll bring it together. Don't worry. I'm just laying the groundwork. I'm trusting that grace is now instructing you, right? So here we go. The grace of God has appeared, the incarnation of Christ, bringing salvation to all, all kinds of people. That's the salvation of Christ. 
What is grace now doing, Christian? Verse 12, instructing us. Again, the us, believers. Instructing us to just live any way we want. You know, according to cheap grace. No! You hear that complaint all the time. Ah, you Christians think you just, you say a prayer to Jesus or just because you believe in Jesus and you can go live any way you want. Seriously? That's what grace teaches us? You, you mean the Holy Spirit of God who is living in you, the Spirit of Christ who is living in you, the Spirit of Christ who inspired the Holy Scriptures. You mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit actually instructs you to go out and sin? What? Is the Holy Spirit going to instruct you towards holiness or towards sinfulness? Holiness. That's what grace does. Grace is instructing you, Christian, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Again, I had many of you, especially there in Croatia, who have said to me how you no longer have those same desires for the world that you once had. Well, but of course. Grace saved you. Grace is now instructing you. And, and what is grace instructing you to do? Say no to the world. Don't be friends with the world. You pray for the world. You're, you're salt and light to the world, but you do not play around in the world. You're not friends with the world. That's what grace currently instructs you, Christian. To deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to say yes. To what? Living sensibly. Sophron. There's your word again. Self-controlled. Spirit-controlled lives. Righteously and godly in the present age. Godly, Eusebia, virtuous life, pious life, holy, Christ-like life. That's what the grace that has appeared, that is what the grace that is saved, that is what the grace now instructs us as people in the church to do. To say no to ungodliness and worldly desires and to say yes to to living a spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-controlled, sophron life of Eusebia, godliness, and holiness. So, grace has appeared. Incarnation. Grace has saved. Salvation. Again, verse 14, we know how. Substitution. Redemption. What is grace doing now? Instructing us. That is called sanctification. And so grace now instructs us, look here, point number one, how believers should live. No to ungodliness, no to the worldly desires, Yes to godliness. Yes to holiness. But grace doesn't stop instructing you there, Christian. Grace doesn't just tell you how you should live as a believer. Grace, point number two, tells you where, as a believer, you should be looking. Verse 13. You should be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Grace has appeared once. His incarnation. Grace is going to appear again to bring you home, Christian. That's called your glorification. Why is it we don't want to be friends with the world? The world's not our home. We are not citizens of this world. We are aliens. We have been redeemed, purchased out of this world by the grace that has appeared and saved. And that grace currently instructs us how we are to live in this world even though we are not of this world. 
And that grace also instructs us where we should be looking. We should be looking forward, verse 13, to the blessed hope, certainty. Of the next time grace appears. We should be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have to tell you, the older I get, the more I keep looking there. Because two things are happening. As grace continues to instruct me, as I am learning more and more how God wants me to live for Him here on this earth, this is the process of sanctification. I have to tell you, more and more, I'm looking forward to that blessed hope, that blessed certainty of one day seeing grace appearing again. The second coming of Christ. I look at this world and my desires for here are less and less. And my desires for heaven, for glorification, for seeing Christ as He is. And that's where I want to be looking. That's where you want to be looking. You don't want to be looking around and seeing what the world's doing. You don't want to be looking at their desires and going, I wonder how that'll make me feel. You know where the world's going, right? It's going to hell. Why are you going to look at that? Why, why do you want to play with that? See, this was great what grace does currently. Grace instructs you how you are to live as an alien in this world. And grace instructs you to look to the blessed hope of where you're going and with whom you're going to be with. And then verse 14, <laughs> the natural response Grace instructs you how you should live in this world. Grace instructs you where you should be looking. And grace instructs you who you should be serving. Again, verse 14. End of verse 13, I'm sorry, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. You know the one who gave Himself for us. Why? To redeem us from every lawless deed. Is that it? No. And to purify for Himself a people for His own possession. Zealous for what? Good deeds. And I love how Paul added that again, teaching the believers in those churches how they should live. Saying no to ungodliness and worldliness saying yes to godliness, righteousness, and holiness, looking towards their home in heaven, but while they're still here on earth, they need to be serving and they are to be zealous, fulfilling good deeds. For the one who gave himself for us to redeem us, to purify us, we're his possession. So though we're looking forward for our glorification, we don't get lazy here on earth. No, we are serving the king. While we're waiting, we are serving. So now let's bring this all together as I conclude. We know the context. 
Paul told Titus how he needed to instruct the believers in the church how they needed to behave, right? Elders needed to teach sound doctrine. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and slaves needed to behave as God-honoring, godly people. Sound behavior. And then Paul told Titus, Titus, I know this is a big task to try to get people to behave soundly. Titus, you and the elders just keep bringing sound doctrine. Be patient, but continue to persevere bringing sound doctrine. Why? Because Titus, ultimately it's not you doing the instructing in the church. It's grace. Titus, you know the grace that appeared? You know, Titus, the grace that saved? Titus, you're not alone. Grace is now instructing the people. And grace works through truth. Titus, you are to teach the Bible. Nothing but the Bible and absolutely everything in the Bible. Trusting that grace will instruct the people in the church how they should live. Where they should look. And who they should serve. If I as a pastor have to constantly stand up and try to motivate you or even manipulate you to behave and to serve, it's not my job. Spirit-filled Believers will be led to do spirit honoring things. Right? Because grace is instructing. And so I know as a pastor, if I'm doing my part, what's my part? First one, keep speaking the things fitting for sound doctrine. Just keep doing that. Yeah, but what if so and so says, let grace do grace's part? Did Christ need my help when he appeared? Did he need my help when he saved? Does he need my help when he now instructs? This is good advice for parents, right? When it comes to your kids. For some of you who are ministering with kids in villages. Do your part. Teach sound doctrine and get out of the way. Let grace instruct. Again, not grace simply is an attribute, but grace is a person. So, let's conclude here. Let's see how smart you guys are doctrinally. Let's see how well you've learned from the instruction that grace has given today. For the grace of God has appeared. That is the what of Christ? Incarnation of Christ. Good. Grace has brought salvation to all or all kinds of men. That is called the what of Christ? Salvation of Christ. How did He do it? Hop over to verse 14. 
He gave Himself for us. That is the doctrine of what? Atonement. Substitutionary atonement. He gave Himself for us. Why? To redeem us from every lawless deed. That is what? That is called the ra 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 Redemption. Doctrine of redemption. Okay, so back to verse 11. You understand the incarnation of Christ. And the second part of verse 11, you understand the salvation of Christ. Verse 12, grace instructs us now to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. What is that? That's not salvation. That's what? Sanctification. Good. But don't forget, verse 13, grace also instructs us where to look. Looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. That's not salvation. That's not sanctification. That is what for us as believers? Glorification. Do you see it? And again, verse 14, we are so certain of this glorification because Christ gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession. And because of that, we are zealous to behave the way God wants us to. That is our motivation. Do you see it? Wow, a lot of doctrine here, huh? Again, the deity of Christ... The incarnation of Christ, the salvation of Christ, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the redemption of Christ, our sanctification, our glorification. And our motivation to serve Christ. Let me give you one other one. A little doctrine. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation of all men. Christ, in this verse here, it talks of, he's referring to how Christ has saved us from the penalty of sin. He appeared, he saved us. Why? How? He took the penalty for us, right? He saved us from the penalty of sin. Verse 12, now as believers in the process of sanctification, we're being struck, we are being instructed to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. You were saved from the penalty of sin. Now, verse 12, you are being saved from the power of sin. As grace instructs you, you're saying no, no, no to ungodliness. Yes, yes, yes to righteousness. So you were saved, verse 11, from the penalty of sin. Christ paid the penalty for you, right? You are, verse 12, in the process of being saved from the power of sin, right? Sanctification. Verse 13 one day you will be saved from the presence of sin. That's why you look forward to the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? You were saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved from the power of sin. You will be saved from the presence of sin. And what is your guarantee? Verse 14, Christ gave Himself up for you to redeem you from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession. You're guaranteed that one day you will be saved from the presence of sin. Because in heaven, there's no sin, there's no suffering, there's no death. And that's why our motivation is, end of verse 14, to be zealous for good deeds. 
And that's why we keep looking forward. Not to the world, playing around there. We're looking forward to our home. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. And we will be saved from the presence of sin. What is going to be our response to a great and awesome God who has saved us in that way? But of course I want to submit to you, God. But of course I want to be instructed by you, God. I want to know how you want me to live. I want to continue to look forward to, the, uh, to glorification. And Lord, I want to serve you. I want to submit to you. I want to serve you in the power of the Spirit and for the glory of your name. We thank our Lord that grace has appeared for His incarnation. We thank our Lord that He has saved us. Salvation. We thank you for His, thank you for His substitutionary atonement. That He has redeemed us. We thank Him that His grace continues to instruct us. Sanctification. We thank Him that we have the certainty of that day seeing Him again. Our glorification. And in between now and then... We want to be a people zealous for good deeds. And I love what Charles Spurgeon said. Drink deep of the doctrine of the substitutionary work of Christ. Because therein lies the sweetest possible comfort to the guilty sons of men. Since the Lord, the Father, made Him the Son who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we, the sinners, would become the righteousness of God in Him. Spurgeon goes on to say, it is the amazing grace of God. You know, the grace that appeared, the grace that saved, the grace that now instructs, and the grace that will glorify us. It is the amazing grace of God that He makes those just who are unjust. That God forgives those who deserve to be punished. And that God favors those who deserve no favor. As Persian said, I, who am altogether undeserving, am treated as if I had been deserving. That's what grace teaches you. And praise God that His grace instructs us daily. Amen?